You've reached the Hyper Guy Motivational Podcast. Thank you so much for being here today. I have a wonderful guest today. My guest today is Michael Melikon. Uh, Michael Melikon, he graduated from Sac State. He got a BA in social work. He served over 25 years in law enforcement. He's done with that now. So he's doing a million other things, which we're going to get into. He's the author of a new Amazon bestselling book called Why Do They Hate Us? Black Life in America. He's an actor. He's a stunt driver. He does really, he's also a real estate agent and he's a father as well. So you've got a lot on your plate, Michael. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And and by the way, the, the name of the book is um, Why Do They Hate Us So Much? You left off the hook. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Sorry it's okay. That. Sorry about that. Um, well, I want to tell you, thank you so much for being here today. I, I know I'm getting you on a Saturday, but thank you so much for being here. Hey, no problem. Thank you for having me. So, you know what? I'm going to start off, always start out the same way. Like, where were you born and raised? Well, I was born and raised in San Francisco. So, um, San Francisco, St. Mary's Hospital. Uh, that's where I was born. Um, spent my youth between San Francisco and actually South San Francisco. Um, my mom and, and dad had separated early, early on in life. And so my dad was in the city and my mom was in South City. So I was between, you know, San Francisco and South City, you know, throughout my growing up years. And what was your relationship like with your parents growing up? And did you have any brothers and sisters? Oh, uh, yeah. I have um, two brothers uh, from both mom and pops. And then I have a um, stepbrother and a half brother. And we're all pretty close. And what was your life like growing up? Oh, wow. Well, you know, my, my upbringing was a lot of fun, to say the least. Um, you know, growing up in San Francisco, uh, it's just so much to do, so much to get into. And, it, you know, it was actually um, a fun um, experience. Um, there was also experiences that I that I seen and witnessed and stuff. Not so fun stuff, not so good stuff, but it is what it is when, you know, you're you're surrounded by certain environments and stuff. So, um, but, but my childhood, it, you know, overall, it was, it was a great upbringing. And what was your relationship like, if you could describe it in some way with your mom and dad? Um, well, uh, my mom, you know, very, very close. My mom raised my brothers and I, the three of us, um, when my dad left. And I think I was about, I want to say maybe around nine years old at the time. Um, and so it was just my mom and my two brothers and I, and, um, you know, she did the best she could as a single parent. She was, um, she worked for San Francisco Unified as a psychologist. Um, and she, you know, <laughs> she put us in every damn thing she could think of, you know, whether it was, um, sports or, you know, she, she had my brother in gymnastics. She had my brother in tap dance. You know, she even tried to put us in a little, um, a little acting thing going on in San Francisco back in the day, um, which I was horrible at. <laughs> I only did that for, I don't know, maybe, maybe a month or two, but, um, but, you know, I actually did get, um, I did get booked for a job back then. I don't know if you remember back in the day when there were no cell phones and it was, um, uh, what was it? Pacific Bell, Pacific Bell. Yes. I did a print ad for Pacific Bell. I think I was, I want to say 13, 14 years old. Yeah, so that was a lot of fun. We went out there and did a shoot out in Marin County. But um, and that was the extent of it, you know, until years later. Here I am. But, um, yeah, no, mom's mom, she um, she raised us as best she could, you know. <laughs> I remember the days, you know, baseball practice, getting out of practice. Um, moms are still at work deep in San Francisco. I'm in South City you know, practice is over, you know, where's mom's at? So, you know, it was a lot of um, waiting around, you know, mom's did it all by herself. So, you know, I, I, I commend her on that. And I love her greatly for what she, what she did for my brother and I. And what kind of life lessons did you learn from your mom? Oh, well, you know, my mom, her, her, her big push was um, stay in school. Um, that was major for her because, you know, she went and she got her bachelor's, she got her master's. She went, she had graduated from UC Berkeley. Matter of fact, she was pregnant with me when she graduated from UC Berkeley. Um, so, you know, mom's is a, is a hard worker to this very day. She's still, you know, out there 
doing the most. You know, she runs her own little thrift shop out there in River City. Um, and just she's an amazing woman. So my inspiration comes highly from my mom because of the drive that she's shown me. And I think that's probably why I have my hands and everything. It's like, you know, it's, it's hard to sit still, you know, so um, just a lot of um, drive and, you know, ethical way of being in life. And what was your relationship like with your father? With my father, it was it was slightly different. You know, my father and I, we, you know, we've we've gotten closer along the years. Um, I had been really bitter um, when he left when I was a kid. Um, for a long time, I guess I could say, hell, I, shit, I hated my dad, right? <laughs> there was a point where I was just extremely disrespectful towards my father. Um, and that was just because of, you know, what had transpired in my um, earlier years and what my mom had went through behind my father leaving. So, you know, I was I was an angry son towards my father for quite some time. But, you know, as I got older, you know, all that stuff started to subside. And, you know, I was just thankful that my father, you know, wanted to have a part of my life and be in my life, despite everything that had went down. So, uh, you know, we we have a great relationship now. You know, we we do a lot of um you know, gatherings and stuff. He loves to barbecue. You know, he always talks about nowadays. Oh, I'm not, I'm not barbecuing at the next whatever we're gonna have. But shit, he's always back there doing it anyway. So it's something he enjoys, and um, you know, I, I just admire him for that. You know, one of the things he told me um, when I was young was, "You could do anything, and if you could take it apart, you could put it back together." So I took that and, you know, I'm, I'm a do it yourself type of guy. I mean, from repairing my automobiles, my cars to, you know, flipping a bathroom or laying down flooring, tile, whatever, you know, I'm, I'm involved in all that shit. And half the time I'm doing it on my own. So it was for what he instilled in me with that message. And that's, you know, where I'm at. And what was your relationship like with your with your siblings? Uh, my siblings and I, we, we're, I'm the oldest and <clears throat> the next one, he's about five years younger. And then the next one, he's another five years younger. Um, uh, my half brother was probably about 12 years younger than me. And then my stepbrother, when well, he's about a couple years younger than me. Well, anyway, um, we, we all have pretty much of a good relationship. However, we don't, I wish we could have more time to, um, you know, um, bond and stuff like that, but everybody's life is just busy and everybody's in different places. And it's been that way, you know, and, and because of my age difference back in the day when we were growing up, we didn't do a lot of stuff and together is what I'm trying to say. Um, and so when my dad had left, you know, it was me, you know, this young boy, um, you know, looking to keep himself, um, uh, busy and occupied with, I guess, friends, you know, I didn't have time for, for little brothers. So, um, you know, we hung out, but not like, you know, I would have loved to have hung out with my brothers, but we're, we're, we're close. I have a little question. I have to interject for a, a friend of yours, uh, Melody. Okay. I wanted to ask you, uh, I, she had a few questions. She said, Hey, if you talk to that wonderful person, make sure you ask him a couple <laughs> questions. So what a melody. One, one of the questions she wanted to know is, um, uh, what were your friends like and who did you hang out with growing up and who were some of your best friends growing up if you can recall and, and like what did wow. you learn what did you learn from those lessons wow 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 that that's a really good question um wow i mean i had great friends great friends um some of us well some of them become very successful some of them still have their struggles um but for my closest friends, we have a strong bond. And I, I would say there's two two to four friends that are that I consider really close. And we've been close for years. Uh, my best friend, we've known each other since, um, should I want to say, uh, kindergarten. Um, I met him. Babysitter was picking us up um, from preschool or kindergarten or something like that. He was in the car and I recognized him um, later on when we were in the first grade, I was like, Hey, you know, you was that guy that was in the van when it got picked up by the babysitter. Um, him and I, when we were in first grade, we had show and tell. I don't know if you ever remember show and tell. 
but that's when you get up in front of the class and you bring something that you got from home to, you know, be proud of, right? So he brought in some ladybugs um, in a jar. <laughs> and he went up to the front of class and again, he's describing his ladybugs or what have you. Well, he drops, he drops the jar. Now you got these damn ladybugs all over the <laughs> all over the floor, right? So I know him. So I, I get up from my desk and I run over there and I'm helping him gather up his ladybugs. And you know, we've been best friends ever since. Actually, um, we both had our first sons within that same year. And they're best friends. <laughs> Matter of fact, they're roommates right now. So, um, yeah, no, no. Um, I have some really good friends, some went off to college. Um, you know, like I said, some have their struggles. But, you know, for the most part, um, the friends that I have, I went to either elementary school with or middle school. Yeah. And what kind of lessons did you have did you learn from your friends if you can recall any when you think back well, on the I'll, I'll say what, what kind of life lessons did you learn from I'll, I'll say this the way the way i i come at my life the way the reason why i am the way the way i am right now where i'm at is because i i'm really like i watch a lot of people and the things right. that they do right um <clears throat> i have more than friends i had cousins and all kind of folks around me that were either my age or some even I have friends that were 10 years older than me. Um, and I just kind of, you know, watched how their lives transpired. And the lessons that I learned was, OK, which path do I want to take? Right. Um, do I want, you know, it's like they're walking this side, this, this fine line, you know, with getting into trouble or, or doing the right thing. Right. And so, you know, after enough um, observations of mine, I realized w which direction I wanted to take in life. So, you know, e even though some friends may have went off on the wrong path, some of them, we still remain friends. And, and the ones that went off on the, you know, the right path, you know, same thing. Um, that's how it kind of shaped me, just, you know, analyzing them and, and learning things that they were doing that I knew I didn't want to do or I wanted to do or be like. Yeah, Michael, I think you have such an interesting life because you, you've done so much and now you're embarking. Now you're an author and you're 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 kind of breaking into the the movie industry and uh, you're doing so many amazing things. Uh, your life has had a pretty and we're going to go over that. Your life has had has been really evolving. And so let me ask yes. you this question. Um, how were your high school years? What were your high school years like? And what made you decide to go to college? And did you have any idea what you were going to study? Um, actually, I, I really didn't have much of an idea of what I was going to study. Um, like I said, my continuation with college was a huge push from my mom. She said, hell, if you don't know what you're going to do, don't worry about it. As long as you keep going, getting your credits and doing whatever, you'll figure it out. So, um, you know, that that just came from that situation. As far as high school, high school was OK for me. Um, you know, where I grew up in South City, um, it was very um, multicultural. So, um, you know, that's what I grew up in. That's that's my background, being in a multicultural environment. Um, but in high school, I, I I'll just say this. I didn't like school too much. <laughs> because of my elementary experiences and, and you know, it's this kind of stuff I have in my book. I, exp I break this stuff down as far as what I went through, starting from as early as preschool all the way up through uh, my high school years. I will say I, I enjoyed my middle school years the most, um, you know, and I wasn't really a, a, a great student at the time just because I, I, I think back and it's from what I experienced in my early elementary school life. Um, it wasn't until I was in college and I realized, hey, I need I need to make sure I focus up and get this shit right. Um, so um, I actually put myself through college, um, graduated at cum laude from Sac State. Um, so it was a major accomplishment for me. Um, and, and that's kind of how it went. So I wasn't I wasn't the best student back back in high school and elementary and all that stuff. But once I once I got into college and I got to Sac State, I got real serious and and I did really well. 
So when you entered uh, Sac State, what, I guess, what were the things that, why did you all of a sudden become a good student? And then what made you choose okay. social work? Well, what made me become a, a good student was because I was paying for it. So I'm not going to pay, I'm not going to pay and get bad grades. So no, nah. so no, it, that, that was my motivation, you know, hell, I'm, I'm paying for this and I know I need to get through this. And so for me, it was A's and B's after that. So, um, you know, that, that's how that went. Now, I, I, I missed your other question. What was that? Well, I think you answered it. I mean, you said okay. that the, the biggest motivator for you was once you realize that you had to pay for this, then you realize, hey, I'm making an investment in myself and I have to do well in school. And, and why did you choose social work? Oh, yes, 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 yes. So I started off in psychology um, and I realized, you know, all these. Um, well, how do I put it in psychology? You know, it, it gets trippy because. You know, you're categorizing all these people and stuff and putting them in these boxes and stuff. And at first it seems like, oh, my, this this makes sense for this person. But, um, you know, I, I realized later that humans are way too complicated for that. And so I just I just lost all interest in psychology after that. But um, I got into social work because I felt I wanted to help out others with whatever struggles they were having in life. Um, I realized social work wasn't a high paying job. Um, which was fine, but I just wanted to be able to help others because, you know, I've had my own struggles along the way. So you finished college mm -hmm. and then, and then what was next? Did you know what you wanted to do and how did that work out? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> um, I didn't, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. It was, I, I know you have asked me the question, I think, I don't know, a few days back. But um, how did I end up getting into, you know, my career and all? And that basically came from, you know, my first son, my firstborn. Um, when he was born, you know, I didn't have a career going. Um, trying to find a job was just horrendous, especially in Sacramento County at the time. I mean, I was just, you know, I was hustling to find a job and it, it just nothing was panning out. And so, you know, I'm still going to school, um, trying to find a way to make ends meet. Um, and so I knew a couple of guys. One of them was a family friend of my mom's. Um, he was a lieutenant out of um, San Quentin. And then this other guy that I knew I was going to school with, and he was working up there at Old Folsom. And so, you know, we would chat every once in a while. They knew I had a son. And, you know, both of them kept saying, hey, you know, you need to check this out, man, and you know, get some benefits for your kid, you know. And back then, you know, we we was on we was on aid and and I wasn't feeling aid because, you know, my mom when 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 I even though she was a single parent, hell, we still had Kaiser, you know. So when I had my son, it was, you know, county, county stuff, and I wasn't feeling it. So I was like, no, we gotta we gotta do something about this. So I was just at a loss in the moment. And when when these guys came to me, they were speaking into me. And they were like, look, you know, get into this. So I had I had given it a thought. Back then, um, I had a really close cousin of mine. We were like brothers. And he was about two years older than me. But he he was, um, you know, he turned into a career criminal. Um, and I would uh, visit him often, you know, throughout some of the facilities, um, you know, such as a CMF, DVI. You know, all these facilities, I'd be going there to visit him, you know. And um, as I'm talking to these other guys who are telling me to get into it, I'm like, I sit in there in the visiting room and I'm like, you know, what the hell do these CEOs do? I mean, this shit seems like they don't really do shit, right? And so then I, was, I told my cousin, I was like, man, what do you think, man? You think I should get into something like this? And he told me straight up, he's like, man, if I had a chance to do it all over, I, I, I would do it all day long. So at that point, I was like, okay, let me go for it and let's see what happens. The rest is history, man. And I, I became the old man and, and, you know, did my little time in there and that was it. So you applied to be a correctional officer. How long did it take you to get hired? What was the process like, I guess? And then oh, in terms of time-wise, how, how long did it take for you to go to an institution or a prison? And then how long did you work, how long did you work 
in the institutions. So, so the process at that time, it was about, I think it took me about a year. Um, and then after that, um, I was, I was there for, I'll say about three to three and a half years. And what, what prisons did you work at? And, and also I got to ask you this, what was the, what was the, the academy like for you? Because you went yeah. from, you had none of that experience. And what was that experience? Was it a shock for you to go through it? And what was that Absolutely. transition? What was Absolutely. that transition like for you? That, that transition was crazy because here it is, you know, like I said, my dad left when he was, when I was young and, you know, I'm the man of the house, right? <laughs> so I'm 14 years old thinking, you know, I, I know everything and I, and can't nobody tell me nothing. You know what I mean? I just, I just live my life um, the way I feel like is the right way to live it since I was young, but despite my mom telling me what I needed to do, but that just, that was me. So when I got to the Academy, you know, back then it was, it was military style. Right. And I, I, I don't know anything about that. And, you know, you got sergeants, drill sergeants yelling at you and shit, you know, and it, it, it really wasn't, it didn't feel right for me, you know, cause to me, I felt that was a little disrespectful, but, you know, in the back of my mind, I know I have my son. So, I ignore that, you know, I just, hey, I, I'm just here to do what I got to do to see if I can make it um, and be able to provide my, for my son. So, um, yeah, it, it was a, a, a it was a shocker to me. I mean, we used to have to do I don't know if you recall or if you went through the academy, but, you know, when we have to do the, um, you know, the, the PT time in the morning, uh, physical training, you know, I think we would do a mile or whatever. Now, I, I used to run track back in high school and I was, you know, probably. Uh, well, a lot of them say I was the fastest in school, you know, and so I was just used to a style of running. <laughs> so when I got to the academy, you know, hell, I got out on that damn track and was running like I just got out of high school. Well, that was a big mistake because after that, you know, I was in excruciating pain. <laughs> you know, my life, my body wasn't ready for it. I didn't have, you know, it's it been a long time since I ran, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So, you know. It, it, it took me almost the whole time at the academy, which was six weeks, uh, to recover from the injuries that I had suffered from being explosive. So um, uh, academy, um, you know, was definitely a different experience. But, hey, you know, I don't regret it. Um, it, it was a good experience. I'm able to pass some things down to, to my sons, you know, about being disciplined and stuff like that. And I think that's what kind of has carried me along the way as well. What did you learn about yourself? Because you entered like the law enforcement culture, right? Just mm -hmm. be something different than you, you've never experienced anything like that. Mm -hmm. What did you learn about the law enforcement culture? Well, and, and, how did, and how did you fit in with that law enforcement culture? That's part one. And I guess part two would be, um, what did you learn about yourself? as you interacted with people that are inmates or people that were in, in the institutions, what okay. was that like? What was that like for you? Well, let's start off with, with um, your first question. Um, you know, <clears throat> my book is about racism in America and it's about my experiences with racism in America. And, you know, since I was young, you know, my high school years, I had a lot of, contact with the police and I had a lot of bad contacts with the police not because I was doing anything wrong I was never doing anything wrong but I was a target and um it came a time where I started to distrust the police like you know you get pulled over man your heart's coming out your chest because you don't know what the hell's going to happen um and, and pretty soon I mean I got pulled over so damn much that I was used to it now I mean I wasn't having the anxiety that I used to have, I became it, just a weird feeling, right? Um, but before that, when I was a little kid, uh, my mom had a really close friend, my mom and dad, and he was a police officer. And we had another family friend who was also a police officer. They were actually both police officers, I think of uh, San Francisco PD. Oh yeah, and South City PD. So, um, you know, I looked up to them. They were, they were real good to me. Um, you know, they let me get in their patrol cars or whatever when I was a little kid. So I looked up to them. 
And so I thought all police was, was, was good people. But when I got older and I started having those experiences, I realized this wasn't the case. So um, as I transitioned to what I do, um, again, my drive was for my son. So um, transitioning into a law enforcement um, profession was very weird for me. And it took me a while to get used to. Um, when I say get used to, you know, <laughs> when you got to do a briefing or something like that, you know, you got to get past knowing that the cops aren't there for you. <laughs> You're there doing a job, right? So, so that took a while for me to get adjusted to. And, and mind you, you know, all the experiences that I've had some bad experiences with, you know, just rotten ass cops and, um, you know, and I've had some decent ones. But when I got into the profession, you know, I, I, I met a lot of good dudes, a lot of good women. And so it kind of changed my perception about, you know, not all cops are bad. You know what I mean? So um, that's kind of how it went for me. And I was able to continue on with my, my career and eventually retire. Well, I guess there's got to be some part, uh, parts of you when you look back on your career working in the institution before you started working on the street. Mm -hmm. What was that like for you to interact? You said you had friends that were or friends that were in prison. Mm -hmm. What was that like for you? How did you interact with the inmates? How did they see how did they see you? How did they view you? Well, because you I know, it for for me, for me, I you know, I'm professional and I'm serious about what I'm doing. I'm serious about my job. You know, and the, the guys they they knew it. And so my relationship with them was, you know, it was decent. You know, I didn't have issues with, with inmates or anything. Um, you know, it was just a, a, a respect thing, you know, the whole respect inside. Um, so I didn't, I didn't have, um, I didn't have a, I didn't have a hard time. I was able, I guess, to relate to a lot of the guys. Um, I mean, of course they don't know my background except for those who may have known me, but I didn't have no kind of, you know, interaction with those guys, but, um, I knew where a lot of them were coming from, uh, what they were dealing with. So, you know, you know, guys, they're inside, they're doing their time. So, you know, hey, you just you're just there to, to do a job. Can you recall anything or any experience that you had when you were working in the institution where you it made it kind of put something in your life in perspective in terms? Oh, of yeah. Oh yeah, I, I you know I I worked. Excuse me, I worked um, CSP SAC, you know, and that's um, you know you got a lot of lifers on that yard, and um, you know when I when I went on that yard, I I was young, you know, and um, a lot of the guys in there, a lot of a lot of the inmates say like, you know, shit like, damn man, does your mom know you're here? Because I looked really really young, right? And so you know what was eye opening to me was I came across a few other guys in there and, and shit, they looked younger than I was. And, you know, they, they was doing life, you know, and it, it, it's like, wow, you know, that's, 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 that's a lot to take in knowing that somebody that looks younger than you is serving this life sentence and they're never going home, you know? And so that, that's touching to me. So, so for myself, I'm feeling blessed. I'm feeling like, you know, I didn't end up in this situation and, um, you know, I'm very thankful about the opportunity to be able to actually, you know, not have gotten caught up or gotten involved in anything that could have landed me in there. Um, and it just gave me a whole new perception on life. It actually be helped me to become a better man um, working in a penitentiary. And why is that? Oh, because you just appreciate life. I mean, you know, um, it's a gift, you know, people, people locked up in, in themselves every day, man, that's, 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 that's no life. So, um, you know, you just reflect on it, you go home, you think about it, and it's like, wow. So, you know, just knowing that the things that I did have in life and where I was going was a blessing to me. So it's, it's just, you know, keep, keep it pushing, you know. What was the process for you like when you left 
you, you didn't work the prisons anymore. You you mm -hmm. started working on the street. Mm -hmm. What was that transition for you like? And why did you decide to leave the prisons? I know you liked doing the job that you were doing, working in the institutions. What made you want to work out in the streets and move from that from that part of law enforcement, the prison side, well, to actually the community side? Well, honestly, <laughs> I never imagined actually, you know, working in law enforcement. Never could imagine. Um, when I went into the prisons, I had gotten advice from certain individuals. Hey, you know, don't let this be your career here, you know. And I already knew in my mind, I didn't want that to be my career. You know, I wanted, I wanted to do other things. And, you know, I was going hard in college at the time. So that way I can change my life later on down the line. So, um, you know, I, I was pushing for that degree. And, um, you know, toward the end of my college career, you know, I was, I was thinking, okay, what am I going to do from here? And I didn't even realize, you know, parole was such a thing um, until I started looking into it from a, a, a career fair that they had offered. So, um, you know, when I learned about that, that's what, you know, helped me to focus on trying to transition because after I started working for the state, I wanted to continue with, you know, the retirement and the benefits of all that. So um, that's why I remained. So um, when I got over into, um, you know, to parole, I mean, the transition was lovely because, you know, now you're, 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 you're pretty much out in the community, you know, and, and of course, you know, you know, it's two different worlds on the inside and on the outside. So I felt a little bit more <laughs> civilized, I guess. Um, so, you know, the transition, the transition was lovely. What was your experiences like when you were out in the street? Like, what were your experiences like? What, what did that part of law enforcement teach you? Well, I, I wouldn't say necessarily so much as a law enforcement side. I would say more or less with um, just being able to interact with civilians um and, and a lot in a lot of these people that i'm interacting with you know they're providers you know they're they're providers for services social services you know what my degree was all about social work so um you know i i had the opportunity to exercise my um degree you know and so um a lot of contact with drug programs and, you know, all sorts of uh, services. Matter of fact, um, when I was out there, I was able to to run a, the uh, PAC program. And so, you know, and I was able to to start that program up in the South Bay. So it was it was a lot of fun getting out there and meeting all the providers and getting them together and learning about what they had to offer and how they can help. Um, you know, people who are being released. And so, you know, it, it was, um, it was, it was a lot of fun putting that together. Um, as far as law enforcement side, you know, I did what I had to do with, you know, my caseload, you know, Hey, you know, you have a law violation or parole violation, you, you, you deal with it accordingly. And so, um, that's, that's how I operate. I, I was, um, I guess I could describe myself as, being fair um, and just being by the book. When you look back on your career, do you, well, at least the law enforcement part of your career, because you have a, a lot of dimensions to your life now. You're, you've got a lot going on. We're going to get into that in a minute. Do you look back on your career and say, man, I really made a difference in the world with some of the clients I had that I worked with? Success you know, you, you, you know, you know, I'll say this because I, you know, I was out in the streets for a minute. And then I went up to administration. So when I was administration, you know, I, I did get some phone calls from some guys who actually thanked me for, um, you know, helping them with their lives. Um, so when I got that, you know, that gave you a satisfaction that you did do something. You did make a difference in somebody's life because, you know, day to day, month to month, year to year, you know, you feel like it's a, it could be a thankless job, you know. Um, and so when you, when you have 
you know, guys that reach out to you and thank you, you feel like you did do something, you made a difference. So I could say that that's what I, that's what I recall. So now we get to go to the other really kind of uh, interesting part of your life. Uh, you, you go ahead and you, you leave law enforcement and you jump to another career. So I guess you have, what did you, what are the other careers? I know you got into, um, it's very unusual. Uh, stunt driving started to, to drive, do stunt driving. Right. Um, how how did that start? Well, I know, what was the genesis for that, and, and what what made you embark on all the other projects? And I know you also got into the real estate business as well. Right. Well, so so I'll just back you up a little bit. Um, real estate for me um, started in uh, 2013, um, and I don't I know you recall, um, you know, since I was employed with the state we have went through two um, major changes, a lot of downsizing, a lot of layoffs, a lot of, what you know, you remember what was going on. So, you know, I need to figure out what was going to happen if, if something happened with my job. So I always wanted to be a real estate agent. And so I figured, hey, you know, let me go on and study for this and um, try to get my license. And so that's what I did in preparation for anything that might happen as far as possibly being laid off from my job. So um, I've been doing real estate since 2013. Um, I love it. Um, still doing it to this day. I service Southern California and Northern California. So I'm, I'm all over the place, man, wherever. And, and, and basically, I, I, mostly I've been helping out friends and family, but, you know, whoever comes to me and they need help, I, I love helping them, you know, find, find their place. Um, so yeah, so I've been doing real estate since 2013. Now, um, with this whole uh, stunt car driving that you bring up, um, it's interesting how this worked out. Now, when I was a kid, I believe it was back in elementary school, and you'll read this in my book if you ever <laughs> decide to get a copy. But back in um, elementary school, I recall um, they gave us like a survey test. And I guess you would take this test to try to figure out what you might want to be as far as, you know, when you become an adult, what, what kind of career you want to get involved with. And so I remember looking at some of the end results of careers. And one of them happened to be a stunt car driver. And so I'm thinking, oh, wow, you know, this is cool, man. I got to do this, you know. I want to be a stunt car driver. So I'm answering this survey like, oh, I know this is going to say I'm, destined to be some kind of stunt car driver and I'm taking this test and I'm, you know, going through the motions and stuff, finally finish it up, turn it in. The results come back to me and it says that I will be a bus driver or a sanitation driver. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> you know, no, not to, not to down on that, but that's definitely nothing I wanted to do. So let's just say I was a little disappointed behind that. Now, let's fast forward, you know, um, a little over a year ago, um, I'm getting ready to go meet a date um, down in uh, Santa Monica. And um, before the date, you know, I go out, um, I had got a hotel or whatnot, and I'm down in the parking garage, and there's these two chicks that are um, parked really close to my car. And they're like, oh, you know, we'll be out your way in a minute. Um, you know, so sorry, whatever. You know, I'm not in no rush. So, you know, just take your time, whatever. Well, next thing I know, we're all the three, the three of us is in this conversation and we're just talking and talking and talking. And then <clears throat> I asked the girl, I said, well, you know, what do you do for a living? So she's like, I'm a stunt car driver. And I'm like, what? She goes, yeah, I'm a stunt car driver. I'm like, oh, shit, right? I'm like, I always want to be a stunt car driver, right? And so she's looking at me, and she's like, really? I was like, yeah. She's like, oh, wow, okay, well, here's the thing. She goes, I know where you can go get some stunt car training, stunt car driver training, and um, see how you like it. And, you know, the industry needs, you know, more stunt car drivers like yourself. So I'm like, wow, I'm just like, okay, you know, I'm not thinking much of it. Um, so she gives me the information. It's a school out there in Southern Cal. Um, 
was a lot of fun. It was like for, I think, three or four days, but it was a lot of fun. Um, and so <clears throat> I went through the course and everything. But in the meantime, you know, she had, well, back in the, um, the hotel garage, you know, I learned also that she was an actress and um, her girlfriend was an actress as well. So she told me, she says, hey, you know, um, I'm going to talk to my manager about you. And I'm not knowing exactly what that means, but I said, oh, okay, cool, whatever. So next thing I know, she calls me and she says, hey, um, you know, my manager wants to, to meet with you. And I'm like, really? Like, okay, well, I'll meet with her. So um, contacted her. She goes, let's do a Zoom. So we did a Zoom. We talked. We talked for probably about 45 minutes. Got off with her. Two days later, she hits me up. She says, hey, you know, we want to represent you. We want to represent you all across the board, you know, as far as acting, modeling, commercials, whatever, right? And I'm like, what? <laughs> right? Me? I'm like, hell, I'm, I'm down, right? And the funny thing is, I, I go back in time, and my mom always tells me this story. She says, you know, back when I first put you in those little acting classes, she said, um, I did that because you said you wanted to be on TV. And my response to you at the time was, well, then sit down on top of the TV, right? <laughs> so that's, that's what she told me, you know? And so um, here we are. Um, this is all new to me. You know, I'm out there in Hollywood um, trying to learn the business. It's, it's a very tough business. Um, and and I, I could have never imagined it. So, you know, you got to you got to really respect actors and what they got to deal with and what they got to go through to be the best, because it's not easy, but it is a lot of fun. So what was that like for you? So you're stunt driving now. You went to stunt driving schools. I, I know you. You're, in, so, you're, in, you're doing the stunt driving gig now, and now you're doing the acting. Well, so how, here, how, here, how, do you here, like, how do you like it? How do you like Hollywood? Well, how do you like the whole scene? Well, here's, here's, here's the thing with the stunt driving. Now, stunt driving is something that, you know, it's, it's training. You got you to keep doing it because you'll lose it. So I've done three days of it. And honestly, I need to get back into it. I haven't gotten any gigs on it or anything, but um, it's on my acting resume. And so, um, you know, hopefully, you know, one day I'll get something. But <laughs> if I do, I'm going to definitely have to, you know, hit some more classes to have some refresher because, you know, even stunt driving is, is not is not easy. You know, um, I actually back in the day, my crazy self, you know, I, I was actually wilding out with you know, doing my own things in, in my cars <laughs> for, for when I was young, you know, from whether I'm doing donuts or, you know, whatever, you know, I was doing it just the way that I felt it should be done. So when I'm at the stunt driving school, trying to learn certain techniques, I found it a little difficult for me because my old side kept trying to kick in and have me do it in that way, which is, is totally wrong. But um, it, it's, it's definitely fun. It's a challenge. Um, but it's, it, yeah, like I said, man, it, it's, it's wonderful. Um, with the whole Hollywood thing, um, I've met a lot, a lot of good people, a lot of really good actors. I mean, it's insane. I'm like, you know, I would go to acting class on Tuesday nights and we go for like four hours, sometimes four and a half hours. And, um, you know, I didn't even realize who I was surrounded by before I seen them doing their thing. And it was an eye opener for me because I'm, I'm nowhere near that level, you know? And so it actually elevated me um, to, to try to get there, but it, it's, it's, it's a process and it's, you know, you have to practice this stuff constantly just to be on a certain level. So that's where I'm at right now. You know, I'm, I'm working with that, trying to get better, um, you know, every day that I can um, in hopes that, you know, one day I'll, I'll land something. I um, just booked my first um, job and I believe it was a, um, something with Netflix. 
um, and it's a voiceover, but I can't talk about it. <laughs> it's, it's it's a contract that you sign and you can't mention it or anything like that. So not until the project is released. So, but but that was my first booking. It was a lot of fun, um, and I just look forward to doing more. What was the stress level like when you're going through this? When you're trying to get acting jobs and is there, and is the competition very fierce? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, it's it's the competition is crazy. I mean, and 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 if you could think about it like this, a lot of times, even within our own profession, you know, back in uh, corrections or whatnot, you you know that it's not about what you know, but who you know. So it's a lot of that in Hollywood as well. Um, but I mean. You know, just being like I said, being surrounded by these people in class, man, their their acting skills are insane. Um, and you realize how difficult it is to land anything. I mean, these people are some of these actors in there. There's they haven't gotten any jobs, and they've been doing it for over a year. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's 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 just something you got to keep at, and it's not like I said, it's not easy, but it's a lot of fun. <laughs> When you found out that you you got your first gig in in in, in the business, how did that make you feel? And is this a new passion for you? It, yeah, it's definitely a new passion for me. Uh, let me just say this: I've had quite a few auditions, haven't gotten any yet. But um, one of the auditions that I got was um, with um, Texas Walker. I don't know if you ever seen the show, but. I was I was so pumped up for that, but <laughs> I didn't get it. I've gotten some for um, auditions for uh, commercials, uh, cable companies, yeah. medicine companies, all that, all that stuff. But they say just keep on trying, you'll land something. So hey, that that's where I'm at, man. So it's it's my new passion, um, just you know, just trying to get there, you know. So at the same time as you're balancing the your real estate. Uh, business and then you have your your real estate uh, agent business and then you have uh -huh. your acting and your stunt driving stuff you wrote a book and it's a bestseller right. on amazon right how did that how did that come about how difficult was it to what what, what first prompted you to write the book i guess okay. and how how difficult was it for you to write the book and how long did okay. it take you to do it very good question um so we're talking about you know racism and stuff um, and I seen a lot of it. I've been a subject of a lot of it. And I had always wanted to write a book about my experiences for years, for years. And I said, you know, one day I'm going to write this book probably when I retire. So I have the time, you know what I'm saying? So, um, with the climate and everything that's been going on in the country lately. And once that George Floyd happened, that was it for me. I, I couldn't sit by and just not express myself and it's that and it so happened to be at the time where COVID just hit everybody's on lockdown and um nobody's going anywhere so i'm like you know what i'm gonna start writing this book now so i tell you what martin i sat down and i wrote this book a lot of times when you write or when you're gonna write a book you, you know, you got to have an outline. You got to break it down. You got to, you know, you got to have a system to be able to be effective at your writing, right? It's like putting together like a term paper or something. For me, it wasn't that way. I had so much experience. It just comes off the top of my head. Like it's just flowing. So the hardest part for me was getting to my computer and, and, and you know, well, I mean, I get to my computer easily, but when I can't get to it because I'm working or I got something else going on, it's that it's that it's that you feel like it's an urgency that you need to get to your computer and start writing. So I sat here and I wrote for days and days and days and um, hours on end. And I actually wrote this book in a matter of. I want to say maybe three months. It took me about three months. So um, when I first, so I did everything on my own. I, you know, I wrote it, I self-published it, you know, uh, the whole gamut. And um, I ordered my first 100 copies. Um, <laughs> the first 100 copies, 
But then I realized something. My dad was reading it. And he says, hey, there's something missing on page, yada, 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 like a whole paragraph. And I go to that page and I'm like, oh, shit. You know, I didn't release it to the public, thankfully, but um, <laughs> I didn't give that book out to anybody except for, you know, just some close people. Hey, check it out for me. Right. And so once I realized that that was a, a big mistake, stop, go back, you know, go through it, you know, get it ready again. A lot of eyes on it. Um, so once once that was done, you know, we went through it a second time, um, much better. And then, then it was available. And then I, you know, posted it on Facebook and I had, you know, friends and family, you know, purchasing it from me, which was which was great. It was a lot of good support out there. Um, however, it wasn't where I needed it to be as far as how was I going to get it out and start putting it out to people? Um, and so I met uh, through my through a friend. I met um, actually through my my girlfriend. Her one of her best friends, like I said earlier, she's writing a book, and so she told me about this company she's going through and all the um, things that this company does for for you know authors and stuff. So. Um, I said, okay, well, let me give them a try because the company that I was with before um, kind of left me hanging. You know, I had invested some money, certain things were supposed to happen, but they didn't have any live contact. You know, everything was, okay, email this or email that, and the support was horrible. So I gave up on that idea. And then when I found this company, you know, it just took off. So they went through, they did a, another edit, so we came out with an updated version, a, a new edition, and the cover was changed, the font was changed, and it's, it's, it's a really good looking book, not to mention, you know, the content that's in it. So um, the people that who have, the people that have read the book, you know, a lot of them love it. You know, I, I'm, I'm getting back. I can't even put the book down, you know. So I, I didn't know I would have that kind of effect. This is just, you know, me telling my story. You know, I'm getting all this stuff off my chest. It was actually kind of therapeutic for me, getting a lot of that baggage off um, from from racist experiences. Um, and, and, and that's just from, you know, it's not just a police thing. It's a society thing. And I talk about a lot of things that take place in society as far as, you know, being in this environment or that environment. Um, that's what I speak on. And so, you know, um, so far, I mean, people who have actually read it, they love it. So let me ask you the journey to publishing. And I guess mm -hmm. it's, it's a, a bestseller on Amazon. What did you take away from writing this book? What did you learn about yourself? And what do you want your readers to learn when they're, when they're done reading it? Well, what I learned was My book seems to be educational. It turned into an, uh, an educational type of situation because at first I'm just writing because I need to get this off my chest. You know, this is happening to all these black men across the uh, United States. And, you know, I've had my experiences, nothing to the extreme of some of these other guys. I mean, it's horrible what's going on out there. But, you know, I, I, I still had a story to tell as well. And so, you know, it, it just, you know, I just, I just learned for myself that um, I just educated a whole bunch of folks <laughs> if they want to read it. You know, um, I did a lot of, what do you, you want to call, um, research. Because my experiences that I had, I would take and find similar experiences that have, you know, been shared in the media um, in history. And, you know, some of my stuff that I share go all the way back to, you know, dang near slavery time. Um, so, you know, what I learned for myself was that I, I put out a book that I feel is, is going to educate a lot of folks. And basically... The goal that I would like to get out of my book is, is just to try to unite people and make people um, aware of differences in culture and to respect one another's culture. So, um, you know, that that's that's the end result of how I see, you know, 
or where I want my book to go. It's just people becoming more united rather than divided because, you know, this country is so damn divided and it's always been divided. And, it, you know, this country can't afford to keep going through all this division. There needs to be unity. So what's your next step? Are you going to write another book, another bestseller? <laughs> And, and have you thought about that? Because you, you, like you said, this has become so such a successful book. Are you going to write another book? And what's next for you, Michael? Oh gosh, Martin. You know, I actually do have um, two books, maybe three books on my mind. I've started two of them. I'm only one of them. I'm probably within a six page, six page. Um, but I love to write, man. I've, I've I've been, you know, high school. I mean, not a high school, but college. I love to write. So, um, no, I'm, I'm going to keep on doing it. Um, I'm just so busy right now, man. I, I probably would have been damn near done with the second one. But, you know, like I said, back to the acting gig, man, you know, we, we'd have to learn a skit on Tuesday and the following Tuesday. We got to go up on stage and, and do it, you know. And for me, you know, just having to memorize these lines and be able to get up there and, and, and just do it. You know, along with being in tune with body movements and your your presentations, and you know, it's it takes a lot. So I didn't have much time for um, <laughs> for writing, and then not to mention, I, I you know, I joined this uh, real estate company. Um, I've been with several companies throughout the years, and I ended up with this company, and they have me representing a certain section of Southern California. But, you know, I can go anywhere, but there's just one area that they want me to focus on. So I said, OK, that's cool. But the reason why I went for this um, real estate company was because, um, you know, the market is way different right now. It's just changed dramatically within the last month. But prior to that, you know, homes were selling for 100,000 above asking and stuff. And a lot of people, you know, a lot of people I see try to get homes that are coming in off of um loans and stuff they're getting beat out by cash offers you know you, you know everybody from the bay area is coming up east and just buying homes in cash so people who are coming in with the loans they're getting beat out they're getting beat out all day long so this company that i'm with they actually will take a person who would otherwise have a loan and actually give them the cash so they can come in with a strong offer say hey i got the cash here we go so you know with cash offers they're you know, there's just so much less red tape um, and you can get the deal done so much quicker than if you were going through a loan. So um, I joined that company because I wanted to help people who were looking for a home to win deals. So so between that and acting, <laughs> I just had no time to get back to my book, but it, it's, it's, it's still on my mind. <laughs> it's, it's coming. So let me ask you a question. In your view, you're so driven. What do you? What advice would you give other people if you had a look at yourself now? What would advice would the would the older Michael give the younger advice, uh, the younger Michael? Or what advice would you give other people to stay driven? A lot of people say, "I want to write a book." A lot of people say, "I want to be an actor." A lot of people say, "I want to be a stunt driver." You're doing those things. How do you put actions behind just the thoughts and the words? Well, first, I think what you have to do is you have to understand yourself. Um, you know, not everybody can do so much or so little. You know, everybody has their certain degrees. But what I can say is, you know, to people, young folks, just set goals, set a goal. One goal, if it's a one goal for the day or a goal over months or a year or whatever, set that goal and just make sure that you're, you, you do something to get work towards it. You know, um, if doors close on you, you know, it wasn't it wasn't meant to be. So try to find something else. Just my whole advice is don't give up. Just just keep trying to find a way, um, solutions to any issues you might have. Set your goals and, um, you know, just just keep on trying to meet it. You know, my drive. I mean, it, it, it comes from. You know, my mom and, you know, my dad, too. They're both very busy people to this day. My dad just turned 80 years old and, you know, he he's still going strong, not to mention he's taking care of his father. His father is going to be 101 in September and he's 
you know, still cooking for himself, going up and down these stairs, you know. So I think it's a little bit of genetics going on here, but um, but it doesn't have to take genetics to just to be a successful person, you know. Just set those goals and and work toward them. You you, you got to set that up. Okay, so I got I got some rapid fire questions for you. We're we're, we're wrapping it up in a little bit. Okay, uh, okay. What is your uh, guilty pleasure food wise? Oh. Sh- Food wise, man, you know, I've been on this health tip. This is what I do every decade since I was 20 years old. I would try to get a little bit healthier. So it's not about the taste in the food for me anymore. <laughs> it's more about what, what is healthier for me, because, you know, you get older, you know, everything starts so, changing. So what's your guilty pleasure? Healthy wise, um, healthy wise, guilty pleasure. Yeah. What do you like to eat? What's your favorite kind of food? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Well, healthy wise, probably would be. It used to be a Jack salad. They used to have the kale and quinoa salad, but they don't have it no more. So <laughs> that that was that for on the healthy side. But on the not so healthy side, you know, of course, that's going to be some fried chicken or something. You know, <laughs> straight up. Um, favorite music? Oh gosh, I love all music, man. I'm I'm in all kind of genres, you know. <laughs> I could be listening to some kind of classical Asian music, to some classical American music, to rap, to jazz, to reggae, you know, to, um, you know, um, gosh, mariachi, you know, I'm all over the place, man. <laughs> favorite film, favorite film. Ooh, favorite film. That's a tough one. Hmm. I mean, I got I got a lot of them, man. I like Pulp Fiction. I like Full Metal Jacket. <laughs> you know, some old school stuff. I don't really watch movies that much these days, just because of what I'm into. But I, you know, I need to watch more so I can pick up on these habits or these these you know ways of acting from these other actors and actresses. But um, yeah, I'm just old school when it comes to movies. Yeah, uh, favorite thing about being a father. Oh man, watching them grow, man, and, and and being a part of their activities. You know, my kids, they play football, basketball, baseball, all that stuff, man. It's it's better than going to your favorite um sports event, you know, watching your kids play. That's it. Uh, a favorite trip you've ever taken. Ooh. Hmm. Well, I say going back south when, you know, my mom's siblings were all alive back in Louisiana. I had an uncle that lived out in the bayous. And man, it was so much fun going out there. We go to alligator farms and, you know, go in the back and shoot these 22s and stuff like that. My stepdad, matter of fact, he came out there one time one year with us. He had a 357. I was like 15 years old. He was like, "Go ahead and shoot it." <laughs> yeah, that was that was insane. But those those are my good memories. I mean, yeah, I've been to Hawaii. I've been to Jamaica. Whatever. Those are all fun too. But, you know, the memories of, of this other stuff, man, you can't, can't compare it. What do you want to be remembered for when you're no longer on this earth? When people look back and they say your name, what do you want to remember for? Um, you know, just somebody who was passionate in what he does um, and just wanting the better out of humankind. You know, that's it. You know. Well, thank you so much for being with me today, Michael. I appreciate it. You have such an amazing um, and diverse and successful career. Um, I can't wait to see when your Netflix stuff comes out and then you can let us know about that. But um, if you like the podcast, give it a thumbs up. Uh, give it good reviews. Um, and Michael, let me tell you this. Um, if anyone wants to get a hold of you, is there anything mm-hmm. that you want to go ahead and put out there? Um, you can go. Please give us the name of the book where they can purchase it. Um, yeah, they, yeah. They, I, they um, can get a hold of you via phone or email with regarding your uh, real estate building business. Uh, what's the best way to get a hold of you? You know, we could just I could just give them my um, Instagram. That's they can hit me up through there. Um, so that's um, Michael Melancon Senior. That's it. M I C H A E L M E L A N C O N S R. And then, how would they get a hold of your book? Oh, so I do have a link for that. Uh, let me see. Can I can I po- paste this up on something? Let me see. Um, you can just give it like the information. Um, if you give the information verbally, you can just go ahead and say it's on Amazon or where they can purchase it at or where they can get a hold of it. Yeah, they can get it. They can get it through Amazon. I, I do have a link for it. 
Um, it's kind of long, so I don't I don't know that one. Uh, Maybe they can get that through the, the Instagram if they hit you up on Instagram. Yeah, if they hit me up on Instagram, link. man, I'll just I'll just you know paste it right on there, man, and, and they'll have access to it. And can you give us the name of the book again? Yes, it's called "Why Do They Hate Us So Much." And again, it's a memoir about myself and you know some close family and friends about our experiences with uh, racism. Well, thank you, everybody, for, for listening in. Until next time, keep learning, and we'll have another great guest on. Thank you, Hey, everybody. Martin, I appreciate everything, man. Keep in touch. Okay, my friend. God bless. All right. Thank you now. Take care.